to the BioRenders Learning Hub's uh, Design Tips for Industry Scientists. And today's focus will be, of course, illustrating biological pathways, a very special type of figure that I think a lot of us sometimes dread making. Um, and kind of rightly so, they are quite intimidating to put together. Um, but we've broken it down into general concepts and design tips, so hopefully it'll be easy for you to tackle your next one. For those that have never used BioRender before, it looks like we have a few new faces or people that have not uh, tried or signed up for the app yet. Uh, it's a really easy to use kind of drag and drop um, illustration tool. So everything that you need hopefully is in the library ready for you to drag and drop onto the canvas. So you can create things like biological pathways, um, protocols, timelines, cell to cell interactions, all those kinds of things to help you communicate your science. And of course, some common use cases for BioRender include uh, presentations, foremost, I would say, for industry scientists. Many of you can relate to that. Uh, publications, of course, gra grant applications, if you're doing that. Uh, proposals, posters, if and when we get back to that one day for conferences. Uh, experimental overviews and outlines. And even speaking to the lay audience, I know um, lay summary figures are becoming more and more popular as well. You want to be able to communicate your science to the general public. So figures, of course, are a really great way to do that. All right, so let's get started. Um, we have a lot of, I guess, tips that we've consolidated based on our uh, over decade of making signaling pathways and, um, you know, intracellular mechanisms and method of action. So uh, hopefully, whatever we impart with you today, you'll be able to implement in your next figure. So the reason why you know, biological pathways or pathway diagrams or signaling pathways are so uh, complex and intimidating to approach is because we're used to seeing these kinds of images. Um, you know, obviously serve different purposes depending on the level of complexity and the output, but generally speaking, they end up being a lot of these kind of circles with words in them and then crisscrossing arrows. Um, intimidating to draw and also intimidating to consume the information as a viewer. So that's, we're probably, you know, familiar seeing, here's another example of a sort of pathway diagram. And, you know, there's, there's definitely a reason why it starts to get very complex. You know, obviously nature itself is very, very complex, way more complex than this is even showing. Uh, and also, this is not what you would see with the naked eye if you were to look uh, at that magnitude. So there's a lot of abstraction happening, a lot of artistic um, freedom that we take when we represent structures and entities and pathways. Um, so it ends up being in our hands to be able to communicate it very clearly, succinctly, and uh, also in a standardized way. Of course, there's also these kinds of images that are almost like a poster. So I've seen these a lot in, uh, if I walk into a lab and on sort of the wall, a lot of you may have these as um, almost decorative, you know, so it, it doesn't necessarily serve a purpose for, um, you know, publishing in a paper, for example, but maybe it'll be, um, you know, earmarked or bookmarked or something if you want to refer to it, almost like an encyclopedia or again, a little bit more artistic in its uh, rendering. I kind of equate this to something similar to, say, um, a map or more of a artistic map. So this is uh, the wine regions of France. I kind of pulled this uh, off of the web. But, you know, very beautiful, kind of a cool thing to print and put up on my wall. Um, but I suspect, you know, if you are in the south of France, you'd probably want... Um, more of a directional image like this, you know, how to get from point A to point B, less so about, you know, what is all the information possible in the most beautiful way rendered in the most, uh, you know, decorative form. So I like to think of building out pathway diagrams or really any scientific diagram in this, in this way. So really stripping away what you don't need to show with what you do need to show or what is important what's nice to have what versus what is needed to have. Uh, sometimes we have to make those sacrifices with 
uh, dialing back the story to show what is necessary and what is not. Okay. So with that, we've kind of distilled um, our learnings into kind of four tips for today, just for the purposes of time and of course how much information you can probably consume in one Zoom session. Um, and we've kind of distilled it to these four concepts. So one is optimizing flow of information, really goes for any kind of figure. So even if you're not making biological pathways, uh, this will definitely apply to any kind of science figure you're making. Two is the idea of color. Um, this is not really a tip, but general concepts around that, which is proper use of saturation, contrast, which all relates to uh, not only legibility, but um, you know, really servicing all types of users, including those that are colorblind. Um, and number three is zooming in to show correct scale. There's a couple of tricks here that you can use as far as um, orienting your viewer so that they're not constantly um, you know, zooming in and zooming out from the macro uh, model organism level to the cell, to the tissue, to the proteins. There's a way to show that a little bit more succinctly. And then four is the uh, proper use of lines and arrows. As you saw and have experienced, biological pathways are a lot to do with how to arrange basic elements, just like squares and shapes and, and arrows and lines. So there's some general rules around that that will help clean up your figure and make it a little less chaotic looking. All right, so uh, I'm gonna pause there just for a second because we've got uh, quite a few new members joining the room today. And just reintroducing uh, Francesca and Cindy who are on the BioRender team. If you have any questions, again, use the chat or the Zoom Q&A. We did release a poll earlier, so I can go ahead and uh, stop the poll. If you'd like to throw in your responses now, you have a few seconds to do so. Um, it looks like we only got a small fraction of the room to throw in your answers, but that's okay. We can pause it there anyway. Maybe it's uh, enough data points to represent the whole room. But for the few of you that did respond, it looks like we've got a, a pretty balanced cross-section of those that have used BioRender and haven't. Uh, quite a few immunologists in the room, cell molecular biologists, and quite a few of, in the other category. So thank you for adding that to uh, the chat if you have. Great, and it looks like a lot of you do collaborate or receive feedback on your figures from fellow colleagues on your immediate team, which does make total sense. Okay, and of course, a lot of you have to make presentations uh, for maybe upper management or management team or colleagues from communications team or others. All right, so just nice to see who's in the room today. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing that poll. All right, so let's dive into this. So first tip is optimizing flow of information. Again, this will be relevant for you regardless of the type of figure you're making. And you may have seen us show this before, but it really boils down to a few basic uh, information flows or compositions. Um, you can't really get around many more types of shapes, I would say, as far as flow of information in scientific images. So you definitely want to try to adhere to at least one at most two of these, and it'll make more sense when I show examples in a minute, but the theory behind it is it should be either unidirectional, left to right, up to down, as much as possible. Uh, try to stay away from going the other direction. Cyclical, you know, of course, if something is sort of a feedback loop or, um, you know, it happens in a cyclical format. That's usually a nice way to show it. Uh, Z shape, this is very common for long sort of experimental protocols or workflows maybe that are, you know, steps one to 10. And you can't quite fit that in a long, skinny kind of cartoon strip. You have to uh, typewriter it back to the beginning like this. So that's that Z shape. Um, M shape is nice for posters. You've probably seen that flow of information on a poster. Um, L shape is a little less common. Fork shape is interesting for uh, any time one experiment maybe has two outcomes, or if there's a decision tree, or um, yeah, if there is general, um, you know, two aims, two specific aims for uh, an experiment. Uh, this is usually a nice way to show. Also, you know, a splitting pathway, of course, if one entity has two outcomes or affects two things. 
And then this can, you can imagine, you know, the number of prongs on this fork could increase or decrease depending on um, the story. So just keep this in the back of your mind as we go through creating these figures together. Um, here's an example of a, a quick before and after that we did live, I think it was last month in a live figure makeover. Um, but you know, the basic science was there and it was uh, relatively nicely laid out, all the icons were in place. Uh, but if you think about the general flow of information, it was a little hard to follow. So if I were to kind of jump out of this and use um, kind of a marker to show what the, I guess, flow of information was, hopefully you can see my marker here, but it kind of bounced around a little bit to this backwards Y shape. And um, obviously this breaks a few of the rules you've already talked about, which was um, either you know, linear, cyclical, or one of the few below. Uh, so what we did was we basically took this and turned it into, of course, a Z formation in the next slide below. So the Z formation was very helpful in cleaning up that story and um, much, much, much easier to follow. Uh, in fact, we ignored this little hanging um, step there, we de-emphasized it rather. We didn't even give it a number really because we thought let's just focus on the main story and the side stories can happen but the, they'll kind of hang off to the side a little bit. So if you look at the before and after here, I'm just gonna go back into presenter mode. This was the before and this was the after. So just driving the principle home of those simple compositional layouts that uh, most images in scientific communication can follow those. Okay, and um, a little bit more review here, just to get us uh, acquainted and our feet wet in design. Uh, the principle of proximity is also a really important concept to keep in mind, especially for pathways. So when you're putting together concepts, it should be easy enough to almost move around your canvas um, as if you had concepts stuck to a sticky note. And um, here's an example again of taking uh, basically the same information and laying it out in a slightly different way, but doing so very easily because things are kind of uh, chunked or clumped together. And this becomes very uh, helpful when you're rearranging your canvas to um, fit every concept of your pathway onto your canvas. And a lot of design does end up being a little bit of pixel pushing. So it makes it really easy if, for example, you group select this, um, you know, all the elements in say number one and are able to move number one independent of number two and number three, et cetera. I hope that makes sense. So just use the idea of proximity where things are close together if they refer to the same concept. It sounds like really basic uh, knowledge, but you'll be surprised how often we see elements of one step kind of bleeding into the other and it just becomes a bit of a mess when you have so much information already condensed on the page. Um, here's a quick example, again, not a pathway, but just an idea of how you can better align elements on a page, uh, especially for multi-panel figures like this. So if we were to draw a box around each step, you'll notice that the boxes don't really align properly and the spacing between them is, is quite inconsistent. And it's not as obvious when you look at it at first glance, uh, but something about the figure is looking a bit crowded. So all you have to do is draw a little box around it, whether in your head or on the actual canvas, um, and then rearrange those boxes so that they're better aligned, and that really cleans up the image right away. Sometimes it's literally just nudging it a little bit and leaving space in between the sections. So again, that's a principle of proximity. Um, and then here's another example to drive the message home. We took this a step further and used sort of the um, idea of hierarchy of text and font and typography. So, you know, bolding the subheadings, throwing in numbers, one, two, three, four, and then again, nudging everything in place so that there's those nice visual hallways in between each step. And you get a nice separation of concepts per step. Okay, so these might again feel like very basic principles, but again, just getting our feet wet and um, sort of diving into making a complex figure as a pathway. 
So tip number two, I'm going to go through in a little bit of theory and then three and four, we're actually going to dive into uh, the application and do a bit of a, a workshop, making, the, making a figure live. So a little bit of background. I don't know how many of you have ever taken um, a design course or learned about color theory, uh, but there are basically three dimensions to color. You don't have to memorize this, just wanted to get it out there so you understand in case I use some of these terms. Um, hue is just another fancy name for the name of a color. So red is a hue, green is a hue, yellow is a hue. And uh, each hue or color can have a value. So that's basically just saying the lightness or darkness of the color. Um, I would say this is the number one important thing to creating figures that colorblind audiences can see to creating uh, focus in, a, in an image. And if you ask any painter, any good painter, and you ask, you know, what are the five things that make a painting successful or unsuccessful, they'll probably just say value five times because this is a really, really important concept and a powerful tool um, when you're trying to communicate using color. Chroma is the third dimension, if you think of it as an X, Y, Z axis. Uh, chroma is basically the saturation of a, of a color. So back in the day when you made your own color pigments from paint, it's just the amount of pigment you'd put into the paint. These days you can think of it as um, pastel colors that are kind of soft versus strong colors like a highlighter or a marker. That's a high chroma, high saturation color. Um, so those are the three concepts related to color and uh, I'll touch on these a little bit in the next couple slides. Uh, Hi, Shiz. A uh, quick question from the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, really great point from Tom is asking if value is the same thing as transparency. Ooh, that's a great question. It depends on the color. Uh, transparency might relate more to chroma, but transparency is interesting because the moment you make a color more or less opaque, it changes the color completely. Um, and of course, if it truly is transparent, it can take on the color of the object behind it. So I'll actually go into that as well because we play with opacity a ton in making figures. So I'll touch on that. Thanks for that question. Thank you, Shiz. And um, I keep talking about painting, but this is one of my favorite painters, um, Richard Schmid, and he's used the concept of saturation and value in a painting like this. And you're probably looking at the three main yellow flowers in this composition, creating this triangular shape. And if you change it to black and white, that still stands out. So um, I just wanted to point that out that even in the fine art world, color and hue, color and um, including hue, saturation and uh, value are very, very important. Uh, one thing that I'm not gonna touch on today that I thought was really cool that they, uh, incorporated in this painting is idea of using complementary colors. We talk about this a lot in other workshops, but yellow and blue are, uh, sorry, yellow and uh, purple are opposite colors or complementary colors. So too are orange and blue, red and green. And they've actually added in little splashes of blue if you can see it in the composition. And really those have like no place in nature because in this particular composition, he's just added flecks of blue, but he knew that that would counteract the richness of the orange and the yellow. So uh, we do use that in science illustration where parts of an image, if they're antagonistic, will use the opposite version of that color to show that. So maybe a cancer cell is orange, um, but you know the T cell or macrophage could be a bluish hue to kind of counteract that. They, they couldn't be more opposite of colors. All right, so here's an example of, you know, such a pathway that we were talking about earlier is actually created by um, somebody, um, a, a user of BioRender who has submitted and has been published in our template library. But wanted to showcase that even a figure like this, your eye probably went to this TGF beta first, as well as to the phosphates because it has the highest level of saturation and contrast and that's just where our eyes are going to go similar to how bees are attracted to you know the highest contrast area which is the flower um, 
Same goes for a pathway like this. You can think of it as the flower of your still life image or your pathway. Um, if I were to now change the focus, change the saturation and value to a different part of the figure, your eye is going to go there first. So I bet you your eye went to the DNA or inside the nucleus in the second image in figure two, just simply by changing the color, the saturation level, and uh, the value. So it's uh, slightly darker, it's higher contrast, and it's a brighter color. So you, you have a lot of fine-tuned control over where you want your audience or your viewers to look first. Maybe that's the focus of your research and you want them to make sure not to miss that part in a complex of figure as a pathway. And I'm just going to uh, actually jump over to Biorender really quickly to show a quick example. Uh, for those that have never used Biorender before, this is basically the interface, quite simple. Um, I'm in my folder here called uh, Pathways Webinar. We've got some templates along the top if you'd like to start from the template. Um, I'm going to go ahead and open the figure that we're working on now and that we've been talking about in the slide deck um, and basically going to do the same thing. So I'm going to create a different focus, which is a little bit off to the left here. I'm actually going to use a pre-made color in our dropdown to change the color of that protein. And maybe this one could be a green. And this is gonna end up being a low resolution picture, but I'm just gonna quickly screen grab that. Jumping back to our image here. There we go. So you can see here compared the, comparing the three figures, I've completely changed uh, the focus of the pathway just by bringing up the saturation and the contrast of certain parts of that pathway. So this can actually work against you if you're using too much saturation and contrast all over the page. It's like taking a highlighter and just highlighting the entire paragraph of a book or an entire page. Uh, you really want to uh, use this sparingly, almost like a very powerful tool, just in the right areas. And really, for the most part, you can subdue everything to almost grayscale, just pastel or a softer color. You don't need to go in with a highlighter again and highlight every single protein. So I just wanted to show you how powerful that is in focusing your viewer's attention to certain areas. These, are, these three are the exact same figure, simply changing the color. Okay, and um, last point to touch on here, not necessarily, again, a pathway per se, but I'm sure you've made figures like this in the past. Um, one challenge when making cell-to-cell -cell figures is that the nuclei naturally stain darker. So I always see uh, scientists struggling to create diagrams that have nuclei or something happening in the nuclei. Um, and then it ends up getting really washed out because the nuclei is so dark, it's hard to kind of overlay elements on top or layer them uh, without it kind of getting lost. So one kind of trick we like to use in industry is to convert figures to grayscale, just to see where that contrast uh, becomes an issue, where there's you know, really high value areas or low value areas. So you can see here that the double-stranded DNA here actually looks single-stranded when I turn it to black and white. It just becomes very apparent that there are contrast issues when you convert it to grayscale. Whereas, you know, in the color version, it's a bit deceiving because you think that just because it's a different color, it is able to be registered by the naked eye. And um, obviously the label here, apoptosis, is disappearing. So, you know, obviously what you want to do is bump up the contrast of those labels. And this is actually where we used opacity and played with the transparency to make the background elements a bit lighter. So um, basically we took this T cell and we decreased the opacity of it. So I think this was at 100%. This one's at about maybe 80% transparency, which gives it a lighter color. Um, again, changes the color completely and you have fine-tuned control when you change the opacity.
you of course have to be careful if your background is really, really dark or something like that, because obviously that will start to show through in the cell. But if you don't, and we do recommend using a white background as much as possible, um, transparency is a very powerful tool. Okay, so I think that drives the message home about contrast. And what I'd love to do is touch on the last two tips here in uh, the application itself. So the last two tips were zooming in to show correct scale, again, to orient your viewer. And then four is the proper use of lines and arrows, or at least the consistent use of lines and arrows. Very, very important for telling your story correctly. So I'm gonna go back into BioRender here, and what I can also do is pause for a second if um, there are any questions in the chat. It looks like there was a couple that may have been answered. Uh, Aishas, uh, one question that we had was how we can convert to grayscale in BioRender. So if you could show that option, I think it would be super helpful uh, for following your tip there. Yeah, absolutely. Why don't I just reopen the figure here that I made just now? And there's a couple of shortcuts here. There's this little black and white symbol. And actually this little question mark in BioRender, that means there's a little tutorial that goes along with this feature. So if I click this, it's gonna show me not only how to do it, but also just the value, or I'm gonna use value for different reasons, the um, importance of using grayscale checker. There we go. So um, I can click this button and it's gonna temporarily remove color on my canvas if you saw that. So there's the color version and then here's a black and white version. So there's this little button here. Um, I can also just go to view, uh, oh, canvas and grayscale, here we go. So if I click that, same thing. Um, and the cool thing is I can actually still continue to go about my drawing as if I was in color mode because it also allows me to see what is the actual true value of a color if I live in a world of black and white. You can see it changing to a different shade of gray. Um, so it's a really, a really powerful uh, habit to get into, to think in terms of value and contrast. Okay. So if I were to you know, pick this color, I don't really know what it looks like in color, but I at least know that if my audience was colorblind, they could see it and that it's got enough contrast for even um, the average viewer to see. So that's the, the convert to grayscale. All right. And uh, just to get us warmed up in the app here, um, wanted to go through six different ways to use arrows and lines. This is a really fast tutorial that I like to run everyone through just to cover the basics. And if you've already seen this, that's great. This will, this will be a nice refresher. Um, one way to use lines and arrows is of course, when you draw perfectly circular arrows to create kind of a feedback loop or maybe a cyclical pathway. Um, we have this really cool circular arrow option in BioRender. So if you go into insert line, circular arrow, all of these options are uh, perfect circles. So they don't behave like our other arrows and that you can't make uh, you know, straight arrows from a, cir a circular one. In fact, it looks like there's another little tutorial here that I could watch. Um, I can cut the arrow into many pieces. I can change the length of that circular arrow and it'll follow a perfect 360 arc. So that's really cool. I'm gonna close up that tutorial and I'm gonna use this. Now this figure that you're seeing here, um, it, we can probably upload as a template if you'd like to, to play around with it. This is just a figure that I've made using BioRender icons. So I've kind of hacked BioRender to look like this worksheet um, just so we can show you the arrows option. So here it is, perfectly circular arrow. So you don't have to do any guessing as far as um, how to make one. And I'm gonna chop it in the middle here, so you can do that as well. I love this tool for using, for showing circular motion. Um, activation, we can keep as a pointed arrow. I think for inhibition, I'll use the flattened arrowhead. This one here, there we go. And maybe I'll even take it, take it a step further and color code it so that 
again, using color as a way to show antagonistic behaviors. Like that. And my, my canvas dimmed a little bit, and that's because I'm in what's called um, a grouped icon. So it's kind of like an isolated, isolated world where if I were to double click out of this now, double click, uh, this is going to move as one piece. Whereas if I enter that world, double click to edit group, I can edit these objects, but I can't really select the things behind it. That's, that's intentional. So I'm just going to undo. There we go. Okay, so that's using circular arrows. Um, how to label things. This could come into effect when making pathways, when you need to label certain things and then differentiate those label lines from movement arrows. That's really important because sometimes what we see is the use of an arrow to show movement, but also show it uh, for the purposes of labeling. So if you use something like this, it looks like maybe the vesicles are entering the cell. Um, as opposed to labeling it. So that's why the use, consistent use of arrows and lines and label lines are very important. So for labels in particular, if you open up the most complex thing to label like a neuroanatomy textbook, we always use lines with this little dot at the end. Even better is a line with a dot at the end and a kink in the line. And here's why. So here's a vesicle and that dot at the end is pretty aggressive. I'm gonna maybe decrease the size of that a little bit. You can change the size of that circle. There we go. And then I'm gonna alt drag just to copy. I think for a PC it's control drag or maybe option drag or alt drag. Let me open up the cheat sheets here. If anyone is a PC user, maybe you can shout it out. Um, let's see. Oh, duplicate. So it's option drag for me because I'm on a Mac. So it must it must be alt drag for PCs. Uh, in any case, you can do that and very quickly copy as you're drawing. Um, and see how I've got that hinge in the elbow. It kind of just uh, frees up that end to point to anything I like. Of course, avoid crisscrossing label lines as well, and signaling pathway lines. Those get really confusing. There we go. So that just keeps things neat and tidy. The contrast is getting a little dark in that area, but I think we're still doing okay. Um, moving on to the third kind of line is sectioning using dotted lines. And now this kind of reminds me of using those paper doll cutouts as a kid. Um, and dotted lines are great for things like cut lines. Um, for a pathway in particular, showing things that uh, maybe did happen or are going to happen or maybe are less likely to happen than other events. Oops. Um, that's a really effective way to use a dotted line. Um, I wouldn't go too crazy with using dotted lines for every single part of your pathway because again, it can get a little bit busy. Um, I'm just gonna make these lines white. Uh, let's see, line color, white. So you see how that contrast is much better when it's white. Very common in surgical textbooks to show the surgeon here as the cut line, um, as opposed to showing it as a solid line, okay? So specific use cases for dotted lines. Another cool trick we like to show is um, actually varying the width of the arrow to denote strength or volume. So um, I'm gonna show this as two arrows, kind of antagonistic arrows. If one signal is stronger than another, generally what we like to do is make that line thicker and that looks silly, so I'm gonna just change the arrow head size. As I said, a lot of good design is just tweaking things to look palatable. 
Um, and then again, taking it a step further, involving color into the mix, portal veins represent as blue, maybe the bile we can represent as a green shade, like so. And just by changing the, the width of the arrow or the strength of the arrow, it actually now is communicating maybe different volumes of liquid moving toward throughout the body without saying, you know, there's more bile as opposed to a portal vein blood going to the liver. So again, just keep that in mind. Again, for signaling pathways in particular, the strength of outcome or the strength of a signal can be denoted with the size of the arrow. And the last two here are pretty simple. So of course, when you're showing uh, transcription, you wanna use what we call these kind of perfectly perpendicular arrows. So they actually draw at a perfect 90 degree angle. So if I were to just draw it out, it'll do just that. Um, and similar to that circular arrow, I can actually change this in situ to an inhibitor line if that's actually what I need. So for those BioRender veterans on the call, you've probably seen this already, but I just wanted to highlight that as an important type of arrow. And then finally, movement. We like to use um, a faded kind of tapered tail when we're showing movement, um, say from you know location A to B. So if I were to use this arrow, actually our default curved arrow is already faded at the end. So you can see here, it's kind of got that faded tail. And we have infinite numbers of nodes you can add. And by nodes, that just means, um, I guess the number of turns that your arrow can take. And see how beautifully curved that is? It's kind of got a nice velocity to it. Um, if for some reason your molecules take a really tumultuous path, you can just keep, you can just keep adding nodes to the arrow. I don't imagine it doing this unless maybe you're representing like a wavelength or something, but um, just know that that option is there for you. Usually just suffices to add one smooth swooping arrow. And again, if you wanted to show that there was a lot of these cytokines or molecules flying in, you could get a bit artistic and make the arrow really big. Again, adjust that arrow head size. Um, and then, like we talked about earlier, play with that transparency. So we have this really cool opacity slider where if you were to kind of subdue the, the transparency of that arrow, you can kind of soften it. And then of course, would probably make it a nice blue. These are all kind of pro tips. So um, I can't imagine using this for, for a lot of reasons, but if you wanna get fancy, this is a cool way to show that. So if I were to zoom out, kind of gives it that Nike swoosh, kind of moving in through space, kind of an illusion. Okay. So we've just with these six different types of um, arrow types, you can represent a lot of different concepts. So I think that was enough review on lines. I'm gonna go back to my folder here. And the nice thing about BioRender is it does autosave. So if anything happens to your browser, say Zoom uh, takes up too much of my internet and it crashes uh, my Chrome browser, I can actually go back in time using version history on any figure that I make. And if I go back to say 2.33 PM, it's gonna show the image that I started with. And then you can recover really any version of the figure that you are making. Just so you know that that's there as an option. Great. And uh, any new questions? I think we're doing okay here. Awesome. Um, and then one thing I'll note is in making pathways, um, probably can't create one that's gonna suit everyone's needs today, but um, one last tip that I do wanna leave with uh, is the notion of creating softer curves and lines to your figure. So you can see here, we've got a pretty good start for a relatively complex looking image, a pathway diagram. 
or signaling pathway. Um, and in FireRunner, you can actually change the line type from being one of those perfect elbow lines to a curved, smooth line. Um, and it looks like this is already doing so. So every time you see um, this little line here that has, it's hard to see it at this scale. Hopefully you can see it. It's different from the corner node. It's got this kind of donut color to it. It's a white outline, the dark center. This actually will smooth out your curves. So this is a nice way to make it look a little bit more waterfall and, and take off those hard edges of your pathway. So I'd recommend that too, if you wanna make it a little more friendly. I think this will actually smooth out all both edges. Um, and this is a little nitpicky, you know, I think it'll just take your figure from looking, you know, 80% finished to maybe 100 once you start implementing these few uh, options. And then if you haven't already noticed, within BioRender, we actually have taken some of that into consideration as far as the contrast and value options. So in this little color preset, if you're using one of our squares and circles with text inside it, um, let's see here. If I were to remove this and I insert a shape with text in it, it's actually the exact same as, as if you were gonna go down here and create a protein. Um, why don't I do that anyway, just for the sake of the demo. So label, and I can type in TGF beta, and beta is a Greek letter, so I'm gonna come up here and insert a symbol. This is really nice because now I don't have to go down uh, you know, to Google and type in beta and copy and paste. It actually is here as a dropdown, so we've got all the most common Greek letters. Uh, we all, we've even got these kind of up and down arrows if you're showing increase or decrease, which is, again, very common in signaling pathways. You can go ahead and use these. Um, but I just need the beta symbol, so I'm gonna get that. And delete these other letters or symbols. Shrink it down a bit. Um, I could change this into a pill shape if I'm talking about maybe a specific protein. So that's really nice as well. But just to be consistent with the top row, I'm gonna make it a slightly curved object. And um, I like the color schema of the red background and the white text. You can see here the first two rows of our options is a dark letter font against a light background. So it's very intentional for us. And then the opposite is true, where it's a dark background and a light font. And this is important, again, for keeping that contrast. You wanted to kind of, quote unquote, foolproof it so that you didn't make any mistakes in uh, your contrast when making signaling pathways. So here's that red option. I think whoever created this template did use one of our templated colors. So now it's matching perfectly. So that's a really nice way to start to uh, include proteins and molecules into your figure. Again, I can option or alt drag to create multiple stacks of proteins, just makes it really easy. And I think the magic really is in kind of these pre-selected, um, pre-vetted colors so that no matter what color you use, um, you won't have a risk of clashing. And that's another concept altogether is how not to clash your colors. I think that's a bit of a advanced workshop we should run. Um, but in any case, you know, using our preset colors for shapes, I think is a good start to knowing that you're not going to have clashing colors or low contrast images. All right. So that's a couple of tricks there again, curving your arrows, using our drop down color options to make sure you have enough contrast and uh, color variation without clashing your colors. And let's see, I'm gonna hit preview just to see what that looks like. It's very nice and centered. The flow of information is quite nice. It's coming from up to down. And then sometimes we can't get away with doing two compositions. So it's up to down and then kind of left to right at the bottom. But I think in general, it follows a pretty nice compositional flow. All right. So I think 
In the last few minutes here, I think I'm just gonna go ahead and show you how to make a figure from scratch. Just to show you that it's not intimidating at all to start in BioRender. Um, I'm gonna set the foundation for my figure, which is maybe just a membrane. Again, some of you have used BioRender many times already, so this will be a review, but um, I like to use the phospholipid bilayer whenever I can. Sometimes it's not necessary though, but we've got it pre-made here. Um, this is an icon, which is kind of a flattened object. I can change the cytosol color, but I can't really change the individual phospholipid heads. If you do want to change the phospholipid heads, I'd recommend using our brushes option. It's represented here with this little blue brush logo. So if I were to drag out this one that I think looks pretty similar to the icon version I dragged out, and I drag the end to the end of the canvas, this is actually a bit more flexible, and I can change the shape of this if I need. I can even separate out these uh, phospholipid bilayers or phospholipid heads independent and then kind of break apart the membrane if that's necessary. If not, I would just keep it as one object. And yeah, you can always change the color. So that's, the, that's kind of a couple of options there if you're putting in a membrane into your figure. Okay, for this purpose though, I'm gonna delete everything and just use pretty simple um, single line membrane like so. I'm gonna throw in a vesicle. Let's see if I can put this together in just a couple minutes. A vesicle, here's a couple options. So these are brushes, which is interesting. Again, because it has a little blue symbol. If I were to drag it out, it doesn't have a cytosol color. Maybe I'll try this one. Okay, I like that one better because it's got a different color than the cytosol. Now it looks a bit lighter than the membrane surface. So I'm just gonna go ahead and change that color. I think that's what better matches. The nice thing about BioRender again is that everything's kind of modular, so it does all kind of uh, relate to each other. And this is similar to that other shape where I can kind of bleb it and make it a different um, thickness or size if I need. Again, gonna go ahead and make it a darker color. I think it's looking good. Um, kind of looking nonsensical though, but that's okay. <laughs> Nucleus. Uh, I'll just grab this one, first, thing I see, first one I see, hang it off the edge. By the way, everything off the edge is not going to export, so you can use that as kind of like your workspace. Um, and TLR, as I notice that many of you are immunologists in the room. And you can use these simplified proteins sometimes, and now we're still catching up here to these kind of canonical pathways, but sometimes we'll have groups or clusters of proteins already made that you can just drag out onto your canvas. And again, this is a grouped icon, so if I double click it, I'm gonna get into a different mode where I can, again, change the color of that pill shape, even change the, um, the label itself, protein A. Okay, so already looking really nice, almost nature-esque. And uh, finally, again, this is gonna be a little nonsensical, but maybe I'll add some arrows just to show that things are moving through space. Oops, I'm gonna um, alt-drag to show that movement. Alt-drag again, maybe it then something happens here, maybe it enters the nucleus at this stage. Um, and then something happens, just copying and paste here, something happens later where it then exits the cell. I'm not really sure here, but just laying down the foundation. Um, okay, and maybe I'll throw in some DNA just to finish off this figure. Lots of ways to approach DNA illustration. Um, you can use, again, our flattened icons that are just beautifully rendered 2D vector shapes like this. Um, I can change the color a little bit in situ. If you need a little more flexibility, we do have a DNA brush similar to the uh, membrane. So for some reason, if your story is such that it needs to show a bit of a more complex shape, 
you're more than welcome to use our DNA brush. Um, for this purpose though, I'm just gonna use this for now. And then protein. I love these kind of generic protein shapes. I'm gonna go ahead and use that. Anyway, very, very simplified pathway here. Sure, it can get much more complicated, but just wanted to show the basics of how to get started. If I hit preview, there we go. And go back to my gallery. All right, so we covered a lot of concepts there, and I know we're coming up on time, so maybe I'll pause, see if I can address any questions that maybe weren't addressed. Um, and it looks Hi, Shiz. Like Hi, Shiz. There's, there's actually a question from the audience asking what's the best way to visualize zooming in from a tissue level to a cell level to a protein level. Yes. On the canvas. Great, great question. question. Yes, that's a great question. So one thing that I would recommend is um, the idea of using kind of circle crops. So here's kind of a really simplified version. Um, you know, we take this from anatomy drawings and that is using this kind of zoom call out. Um, this is a really simple way to show uh, zoom ins of something that's quite complicated. So what we did was created a circle crop of this mouse structure and put it around a circle. Um, in the case of pathways, however, oh, here's another example here of um, kind of showing the inside of one of these tiny wells um, and then showing that sense of scale in a really small area, actually. So that's one way to do it. Um, another way we like to do it in kind of cellular pathways is to just draw kind of a box around um, two shapes. So maybe something like this. I can actually shrink this down, for example, and remove a lot of the uh, extraneous objects and keep it very simplified. You know, I'd obviously remove all of this um, but if I were to be concentrating on, you know, a certain area, say that that was my focal point of my story, it's obviously quite small and difficult to see at that scale. But you kind of want to orient your viewer to say, hey, this is a cancer cell and a T cell interacting. So what I do is maybe make a little, sometimes I call it like a surgical window, just kind of a, an orientation of, hey, this is the part of the body that I'm talking about. And then of course, um, you know, then zooming into creating that close up, but um, at a larger scale. I hope, I hope that's helpful. I, I would definitely say that that's one of the uh, more popular ways to do it. Like so, and maybe you do wanna show it sideways. This becomes really tricky when you're showing, you know, say a virus interacting with a cell and then, you know, that then interacting with another cell. So you get a lot of these kinds of changes of scale. And move this forward. And if you can get away with showing, I'm just going to hide these grid lines. If you can get away with showing something like this, that's, that's great. Um, sometimes you could even turn the cell around like so to create that kind of environment. And of course, like I said, um, everything that hangs off the edge of your canvas is not visible. So that ends up being your area of focus. And then of course, you know, color match to the thing that you're zooming into. So whether it's blue and orange, and then you don't get the kind of weird, uh, enormous protein on a tiny cell surface kind of thing. Hit preview, there we go. So sorry, that was a bit rushed, but that, was, that would be one way I'd approach um, if you have multiple interacting cells. And of course you can multiply this to use against many other interacting cells as well. All right. Thank you for the really great questions, by the way. And um, for those that are wondering how I'm panning around here, I am pressing spacebar to move things around. And if you don't have enough space, you can always close up your library to add more space in your canvas. 
but just so you know that that's, that's there as an option. All right, so it, we're just coming up to three o'clock or wherever you are in the world, it's three o'clock our time in Toronto. Uh, thank you so much for sticking with us to the very end. Hopefully you learned a thing or two and uh, we really appreciate you joining us today. If you'd like to join us for um, another webinar, if you have different ideas for uh, another topic specific to, of course, industry scientists, because again, the um, uh, I think use cases are quite unique for a lot of uh, industry folks. So if you have ideas, please go ahead and um, send those to, I guess, Francesca, if that's okay, if they send it your way. And um, if you like this webinar, we will send out the recording for it. So you'll be able to kind of go through and maybe review some of the tips that we've covered. Um, and for those that are bioender experts, hopefully you learned a thing or two from what we described today for your next figures. Awesome. Okay, well, we'll sign off here, but thank you again for sticking with us and um, we hope to see you at the next one. And thanks for all the great feedback. We'll definitely include more templates in different fields. Um, and again, more themed webinars. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks so much.